So you guys have written and captured some pretty amazing stories and insight in your book, In Our Nature. For those of us who haven't read it, how would you describe it? Boom, right in there with that. <laughs> well, there's a few different ways you could describe it. Um, it turned out to be a lot bigger than we thought, so I guess it's a coffee table book. Um, and it's full of essays, photos, um, and some poetry. Um, most of it's written by Dave and I, but there's some guest essays from friends um, and a couple of photo essays from friends who are really incredible photographers, which we were really lucky to be able to share. And the themes are around conservation, climate change, belonging, and there's even a little bit of rugby in there. <laughs> Would you add anything? Yeah, one of the things I was really interested in exploring is this um, feeling or sense of belonging and what does it actually mean to live in a place that you, you've, you feel like it's home. And once you live, in, live somewhere and that's home, how does that change the way that you live? If you think that this place where we live is going to be home for my kids and my grandkids and their kids, I think it really changes the way that you interact with your home and, and, and the places that you, you live and love. So, yeah, as Em said, um, we kind of wanted to just tell a few stories at the start, but once we got writing, um, realised that there was a, a lot to think through and and hopefully convey some of some of that and some of the more hopeful stories. There's uh, certainly no shortage of doom and gloom at the moment. Um, so we tried to tell some, some more hopeful things. I think we also um, had spent that year out of Australia and used it as a way to think through some of the things that happened to us and to try and deal with people asking us what we'd been through. You know, it was a good way to process a lot of those things. But then once we started writing, we found, you know, there were a lot of other people's stories that we wanted to include in there, um, stories about place that, places that we'd visited or people that we'd met who were doing really incredible things and who consider the places where they live and work to be home mm -hmm. um, and trying to share some of those stories so that we could all be a little bit better at thinking about it. Mm. Yeah, and just on that idea of home and belonging, would you consider home a physical place or more of an abstract idea? <laughs> that, I mean, that, that's for many non-Indigenous Australians, that's a huge question because we're all immigrants. And I think um, a big question we have to grapple with is, is how do we actually become naturalised to this place? How do we actually learn how to love it and care for it in a way that Indigenous Australians have been doing for tens of thousands of years? And, you know, the kind of European way of doing things has brought it ecologically, like to the brink in 200 years. So it's a tough question. I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd guess it can be a combination of both. Yeah, I think, and I think it has to be. I think it has to be. But I think being able to actually have that sense of of belonging to a physical place that you love, yeah. um, to me, that that's cultivating that is the way out of the mess that we're in. And I, I think when we actually start to um, like you can't, you can't, you're not going to fight for somewhere that you don't love and you can't really love somewhere that you don't know. And so I think it's getting to know the places that we live and uh, learning about their history. Um, yeah, and, and then I think we're actually going to start to, to stand up and, and, and say, hang on, we're not, we're not living in a way that's actually, um, you know, looking after future generations of not only humans, but of, you know, wombats and numbats and platypus and koalas and, and all these, um, you know, other animals that, that call uh, Australia home. Well answered. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Where would you call home? Mm. Well, I guess part of the book is, is, is grappling with that, where I think as an immigrant, you realise that you 
probably don't feel like you belong either place. You feel like somewhat of an outsider here in Australia. Um, and if you ever question some of the kind of the big myths of, of our society, you get told that very quickly to ship off back to where you're from. Um, and when you go back to, uh, yeah, for, for me, Zimbabwe, where I, I really have a sort of a deep sense of connection with, um, yeah, it also doesn't necessarily feel like home anymore, given everything that's happened. So, um, yeah, grappling with that and, and trying, to, trying to see what that means. Um, but I, I think more and more Canberra is, is, is feeling like home and, um, yeah, feel incredibly grateful to, to live here and be part of the, a community here um, and be able, to, be able to contribute in some way. I think that was a big part of um, the time we spent in Zimbabwe in 2017 for me was, you know, living in a totally different country and culture and in a different historical context. Um, gave me a really strong sense of wanting to contribute here in Australia and I'd grown up with a sense of which I guess like, is probably true for a lot of young progressives, a sense of like shame almost around being Australian. Um, you know, there's a lot of things in our recent history that are really difficult, you know, from the stolen generation to um, the way we've dealt with land here. Uh, but something about getting that distance from home gave me a real sense of love of Australia and wanting to um, help build the kind of future where I would feel a lot more pride in being from here and of here. Uh, yeah, and so I guess I've spent the last few years trying to do that in my own ways. Um, and I think part of it is that sense of, yeah, I want to fight for a better future here because I actually love it now. Uh, and part of that has come from knowing it, which is not being afraid of our past and not being scared to grapple with some of the bad things that have happened, but also the really wonderful things about Australia. Um, and that's given me a really great sense of love for the natural world here, but also a deeper empathy for people who in the past I maybe just wrote off or disregarded because they didn't agree with their views. Uh, and I think that's a really powerful thing to... Um, sit with. So another question for you guys, what do you think the most important thing you took away from your time in Zimbabwe was? I mean this isn't the most important thing but one thing that I really found surprising was I mean we spent seven months farming and farming is really hard uh, and I don't think I quite had a appreciation for that before we went you know we were running this sort of derelict citrus farm and trying to grow a crop of tomatoes and you know it was just like every day there was a problem you had to fix and you were trying to decide which problem to fix first and um, yeah, it gave me a real um, appreciation for the people who grow our food uh, yeah yeah and I, I think it really drove home just how um, I guess hard life is for most of the world's population and um, you know, for most Australians uh, we can't really begin to imagine what it's like for the majority of the world um, uh, with the, you know, the lack of safety nets and, and um, just the reality of day-to-day -day life. Um, and then I guess the other thing is, is how do we um, as Emma was talking about, you know, with the history of colonialism, how do we actually move forward? Like, how, what does it actually mean um, to seek truth and reconciliation, some sort of justice? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a really complicated thing, but I think, yeah, the more people that are um, thinking about a w way forward and actually trying to live that in some small way, I think that's when we'll start to see our, our communities and our society um, yeah, heading towards, um, yeah, a, I don't know, a more, more hopeful future, hopefully. So what inspired both of you to take such a driven approach to environmentalism? I guess I grew up uh, 
pretty obsessed with like birds and animals and um, you know, I think a lot of that came from uh, my dad and my grandfather. My, my dad was loved birds um, and had grown up um, you know hand raising uh, hawks and eagles and and all the rest and so my brothers and I did that as a kid. We had um, some black shouldered kites. We had um, a clutch of barn owls that were had fallen out of the nest. And I don't know. I guess just seeing how interesting it is, like it's 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 incredible. Um, that kind of grew into caring about you know the places we live and 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 then seeing what a bad job we're doing looking after them um, yeah it's devastating like to to see um, you know here in Australia uh, for example old growth forests cut down and turned into wood chips or you know paper that you can ride on and then recycle at a, at a, at a financial loss like it's you know you could understand if you know this is um, back in the last century where native um, logging was like fueling the economy but we're now actually subsidizing the cutting down of like hundreds you know sometimes up to a thousand year old trees like it's just it's just madness um and i think the more i learned about that um i don't know like if you're if that doesn't make you mad and make you want to do something then um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's insanity and I, I think future generations, if we don't turn things around, are going to look back on all of us and probably judge us not very kindly. Um, I know I would. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, and fairly. Yeah. So I, I guess f for me it's, it's stemmed from actually wanting to try and build something different like there has to be a better better way like you know you and I shouldn't be spending our tax money to cut down ancient trees to make a loss when you know all the scientists are saying they're worth far more um, let alone all the you know the animals and all the rest that, that call them home um, they're worth far more as a, as a carbon sink so yeah, I think, you know, I think it's something that we're doing fairly badly at the moment. Um, and there's, there's so much room for improvement, but I, I do genuinely think that it, it is a way for our culture to start to deal with a lot of the, the, the sadness and, and disconnect that we, we find um, by actually I don't know, having, having a, a better myth of actually looking after the world and trying to live, live more in that way. Exactly, agreed. Did you have anything to add on that, Emma? Yeah, I guess my path to caring about this was pretty different from Dave's. I, I grew up going on lots of holidays to just spectacular parts of Australia in the northwest of Western Australia. Um, but my priority as a teenager and in, into my early 20s was always around people and social justice. Uh, and it was only sort of getting to know Dave and spending some time in Zimbabwe that I began to really realise in a um, for quite a profound and sort of quite visceral way how much our fortunes are tied up with how we manage the land. Uh, and you can see that really clearly amongst subsistence farmers uh, and the rural poor who are depending on the land to provide food for them and hopefully a surplus to sell so that they can send their kids to school or pay for healthcare. Um, but it's also true in a wealthy nation like Australia. Um, you know, our fortunes have very literally been tied up with the land as we've kind of made our way in the world on the back of um, wool and minerals um, and all of that comes from the land and if we do a poor job of managing it then that's a very short-term wealth whereas if we were to take a longer-term view we could become a net exporter of renewable energy and build our wealth that way. Um, 
So it was only for me kind of seeing how it was tied up with the well-being of all of us um, that I kind of started to take more of an interest in it. And then as I took more of an interest in it, it was the kind of thing Dave was saying about you won't fight for something unless you love it and you won't love it unless you know it. And so coming to pay more attention to the natural world, I got to know it better and then I started to love it. Um, and so that's kind of, I guess, flipped things on its head for me where I see that we can't have a just future for people unless we have a just future for the land. Mm -hmm. You said you grew up focusing a lot on people and relationships. So how do you think that helps you with conservation efforts now? Well, I think one thing that can be really difficult is that if you're focused on thinking about the land, it can be very easy just to judge other people's motivations. And one of the things we talk a lot about is in that example that Dave gave about forestry, it's not the people who work in the logging industry who are the enemy. Um, and it's very easy to fall into those kinds of um, ways of thinking that can be really unhelpful because if we want to have a future where those forests are preserved, we need to find somewhere else for those people to be employed. Um, and I think a lot of times we can get so caught up in fighting for something that we don't actually think about the other people that are involved and what that, what our end goal is going to mean for them and how we could accommodate them in the future as well. Um, so I think bringing that lens of caring about people can really help you to reorient what you see the solutions as being. Yeah, absolutely agreed. And you see that even today with things like the Adani mine, where people need the jobs, there's a lot of employment opportunity there. How do you reckon we should go about addressing that problem while also not allowing things like the Adani mine and promoting environmentalism? I, th I think one of the things is we've become in many ways reactive and haven't actually been able to tell a more compelling story about what the future could be like. And I think that's a really impart important part of it is actually sparking people's imaginations to show them that, um, I mean, coal itself is not bad. It's a, you know, it's something in the ground. Yeah, it's, it's pretty natural. It's, it's our management that's, that's the problem. And um, sure, it's, it's got us to where we are, but I think the future has to, we all, we, we all know the future has to be different. So it's about actually being able to imagine what that could be like. And I think that's somewhat, something that someone like Damon Gamow with 2040 um, has really struck a chord with, is actually saying, listen, um, <laughs> we, you know, we, we're not hating coal miners. This has been an important part of, of our history, but it's time to actually transition to something else, to other jobs. And um, you know, there's so many people doing work um, on this. If you look at Beyond Zero Emissions Million Job Plan, you know, to create a million jobs through a just transition uh, to renewables, I think that's got to be the focus, not, not the kind of stop Adani, um, because the reality is Adani is one of a whole number of other mines up there. Um, and if we take the, the way of kind of just trying to stop individual projects, if you actually look at, the, look at Australia and how many fossil fuel projects are planned from Santos drilling in the Pilliga to Whitehaven building a new mine um, near Gunnada to, you know, wanting to drill for oil off Ningaloo, uh, it's, you know, there's hundreds, probably thousands of projects. So I think the focus really has to be on, be, be on creating a, a, a better future. And that'll include, you know, a lot of employment and you know, potentially better jobs, safer jobs. Um, and we all obviously benefit from a, from a cleaner environment. Mm, yeah, absolutely. So would you agree that there is a lot of potential for employment moving towards renewable energies? Well, I'm not... Yeah, I'm not, I mean, I'm not a, an economist or anything like that. I'm a, a, a dumb footy player. But um, from what I've read, it looks like there's some pretty smart people from Mike Cannon-Brooks um, to you know, Beyond Zero Emissions. The Climate Council have done some really cool 
modeling, there's plenty of jobs out there to be created uh, and, and long-term jobs, jobs of the future. Exactly. Um, and I, I guess that the, the challenge for young people is to really force the issue. And at a time where, you know, we're faced with this unprecedented crisis of COVID um, and the kind of human tendency is to fall back on what you know. And if you look at um, Prime Minister Morrison and his government's plan to back new gas projects, um, like if you're a young person, <laughs> you should be standing up and saying, no way, we have to actually build something better. We have to use this moment to actually create a better future, um, particularly for young people. Like, yeah, you know, this is, absolutely. This is, a, I think, a really pivotal moment. Um, well, I mean, that, that's all true and it's your future that's being decided on now in how we recover from COVID. Um, but, you know, there's a big role for your parents to play too. You know, they vote, they've got power, they pay tax uh, and it's your future that they're deciding about as well. And I think we can put a lot on young people saying, you know, you need to get out in the streets. But actually, you know, there's a lot of responsibility that your parents and your grandparents' generation have, and they can still make a difference, mm. you know. They're making choices today and tomorrow and at the next election about what kind of future they're going to build for you. And I think it would be such a great thing if we could reorient our thinking about politics to conceiving of it as about our shared life together. And it's not necessarily about, you know, whether you're going to be able to buy a house or not. And that's so hard for older generations to get their head around because that's what politics was for when they were your age. But we live in a different world now with different problems and they have the opportunity to build a really wonderful future for their children and their grandchildren. Um, but it's going to mean that they're going to need to rethink their priorities and reconsider how they've thought about politics. And I think that they can do that. I was just wondering, how do you think COVID will affect conservation efforts and what's the best way to keep momentum for climate action going during such a time? I think it's, it'll really vary around the world. You know, I think for, say, a lot of African countries who rely heavily on tourism, it's devastating and yeah, it already has devastated um, big parts of the industry there. In Australia, yeah, it's, it's hard to know. Um, yeah, I think so much is driven by our priorities. Um, the last five years we've kind of cut our spend on, budget spend on conservation. I think we're down to 0.2%, something like that, $900 million. Um, Yikes. <laughs> yeah, which, which is pretty crazy. Um, so I, I don't know. I think, you know, it's, uh, it, it depends on what ideology you come from. If, if you don't think it's important, then COVID's a great time just to keep slashing it and, and, and who cares. Um, but if we do think it's important, then it's a time to actually start creating more jobs in conservation and um, really valuing that. In terms of climate action, you know, I think this, the school strikers have done such a great job um, over the last few years in, in trying to raise the, the consciousness of the issue and, and, and really push for meaningful action. Um, that's potentially harder with, with all the COVID restrictions. Um, but I think if you look back to, say, the civil rights movement in the US, actually a, a really big part of their strategy was divestment and getting people to move their money away from um, either like fully white owned um, institutions um, or institutions that were actually um, supporting segregation. And in Australia, <laughs> um, the big four banks continue to, you know, support new fossil fuel projects. And so, yeah, <laughs> the average Australian has a huge amount of power just by moving their money to someone who isn't lending to, um, to fossil fuel projects. And I think that, to me, that's probably one of the biggest thing, things an individual can do is move their own money out of a super fund that invests in fossil fuels, out of a, one of the big four banks. Um, and there are plenty of great options out there who've, and like if you look at 
um, super funds who've performed better than most through COVID. Um, and then encourage your family and friends to do the same. You know, I'd, when, it, when it starts to actually pinch um, for these big um, financial institutions, I think then, then we're gonna start to see, see, see change. So that's something you can do from your computer. Mm, yeah, exactly. I think um, a lot of people have also maybe lost a little bit of focus on conservation during, like throughout this whole situation. So how would you guys go about getting those, pe those people's focus back on climate and the environment? I think, um, I mean, I think that there's a lot of things that we can look at in, during COVID and feel a bit despairing about. But a couple of, I think, really great things have happened. One, we know now that we can act together. We know that actually in a crisis, we can make decisions that make our life a little bit harder, but are good for the people around us. Uh, we know that when we have a clear vision of what we want to get to, we can stomach a bit of uncertainty in the interim um, and that our governments can take swift, decisive and even expensive action um, to take care of us. Uh, and they're the kinds of things that we need if we're going to solve the climate crisis. Unfortunately, with the climate crisis, climate action actually has some huge benefits, both to you know our life and well-being, but also potentially to the economy. Um, so I think we're in a great position to be able to leverage that if we want to. Uh, and that's the question I guess you're asking is how do we get people to want to? How do we get people to refocus on those things when, you know, a lot of Australians are losing their jobs, their uh, future is feeling very uncertain. Um, and I think part of it is that we need to be better at doing that myth-making that Dave was talking about. What kind of future do we want to build? And how do we communicate that so that everyone feels included and it's not just a club that you get to be part of if you're a greenie, um, but if you're a coal worker or a logger or any of those kinds of people who do that kind of work who've traditionally been pushed out, how do we bring those people in and say, COVID's shown us that all of our livelihoods are uncertain, so what kind of future do we want to bring to make that all feel more certain. Um, and it's only going to get increasingly uncertain if we don't start taking care of it now. So I don't, I don't really know what the answer is, but I think that there's a lot of um, seeds of hope that have been planted during this crisis that we could tend and see flourish or we could let wither and die and that's up to us. No, I absolutely agree with that. I think you made some great points about what we can do when we all come together. Um, and just sidestepping a little bit, uh, just a question. Um, so I did, I read your Guardian article on regener regenerative agriculture, and I was, you said one thing, that was one thing that could improve the nation. And I just wanted to know, uh, could you elaborate a little bit on what regenerative ag agriculture is, what role it plays in our future, and why it's important to you? Sure. So, this agriculture is the production of food and fibre and kind of what our civilization has is built on. If you look at the way that we've uh, most people have been farming for the last few hundred years, it's kind of been a process of increasing intensification with more and more inputs, uh, producing more and more food. Um, so we're producing a lot more food than we ever have. Um, but we're getting to the point now where all of these inputs, um, fertilizer, um, pesticides, herbicides, are having a really negative effect on the soil and on the environment. And if we don't actually start to um, address those problems, th it, you know, our yield is going to go off a, off a, off a cliff. Um, and particularly in Australia, like we're the driest continent. Um, in the world, we should be at the forefront of, of finding ways of farming where you're actually trying to work with nature, not not against it. Yeah, um, yeah we've um, Australian agriculture is kind of uh, has been a very European way of farming on an ancient continent with a totally different climate to um, European conditions, and we've got some leaders in regenerative agriculture. Um, you know, from Charles Massey 
Um, Colin Sice, who's been doing some pasture cropping. Um, Peter Andrews, uh, you know, a bunch of sort of world leaders. So I think we're really well, well placed if we can actually embrace that and, and try to move towards a, a food system that is yeah, focused on producing really high quality food, but doing it in a way where we're not degrading the land every year by losing topsoil. In a nutshell, I guess that's a bit of a yeah, explainer. Yeah, you mentioned a lot of farmers that take this approach to um, like farming and agriculture. Do you think that people have the power to, um, to sort of fuel this movement by investing or spending their money on those farmers and on that kind of environmentally friendly agriculture? Yeah, I think as, a, as someone who eats food, which we all do, we, 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 do, we do have um, a huge amount of power to actually slowly change the system with our purchases. Um, you know, I think one of the, the problems is that you know, most people are under financial stress. So to um, all of a sudden spending all your money on food at the farmer's market um, seems out of reach for people. But if everyone just spent $10 of their food bill a week, uh, you know, that really adds up across the population. And you know, I think then we will start to move towards a food system that actually takes into account all the, the costs that we're currently externalizing. So say you're a farmer and every year you're losing um, a whole bunch of topsoil yeah. and you're producing a lot of um, carbon dioxide, those costs aren't really reflective in the food that you sell. Um, they're, they're externalised. Someone else foots the bill. Um, and if you're producing really poor quality um, food that you buy at, you know, Macca's or KFC, um, you know, they're externalising their costs onto society. That's, that's the health the health budget is having to look after people who are, who are sick. Um, so I, I really think once we actually start to take those costs into consideration, we actually find that farming um, in a more regenerative way, which is potentially more labour intensive, um, which, you know, will create jobs, <laughs> which is great. Exactly. Um, which has, you know, been a, a, a big talking point during COVID. Um, but also produces really high quality, nutrient dense food, and that's that's certainly what we need. Yeah, as someone who goes to the farmers markets, I can vouch for that. Mm, yeah, and I think just having that relationship with the people who produce your food is a powerful thing. Um, I guess you can you can grow up in Australia. Um, you know, like most Australians, you live in a big city, and it's very easy to think that water comes from a tap. And you know, food comes from one of the big supermarkets. The reality is, there's a there's a whole you know um, huge area of land in Namudgee and the Brindabellas, and that's catching that rainwater, filtering it, uh, and then all the pipes to get it to your tap to open up. And it's the same with you know food in the supermarket. There's a whole bunch of farmers and a huge value chain. Um, and I think yeah, it's 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 a healthier way of living being a little bit more connected to all of that. Yeah, I agree. And it's about bringing us closer to the land and environment. Mm. I think one of the other great um, benefits of moving toward that kind of system is the connection that it does give farmers with more people. You know, it puts more people on the land because it's a more labour intensive kind of farming. It removes some of the um, distance between the farmer and the consumer and you know we all know that mental health statistics for, f for farming communities are extremely bad and so anything that you know has a benefit on mental health in those communities is also a really wonderful thing so to be able to implement farming systems that take care of the land but also take care of those communities I think is a really crucial thing for us to be thinking about because we all have to eat uh, and the people who are producing our food shouldn't be paying such a high price for doing that. Um, so I think that's another piece of the puzzle that, yeah, I feel really excited about when we talk about regenerative agriculture.
Mary Oliver and the art of paying attention is a big clue into being connected to where you are and people and place. Uh, I wonder if you uh, could give a clue to how that practice developed in you and if a young person was to ask you, help me out, where do I start with being attentive, if you could offer a clue. Well, for me it probably started with birds and animals and spending time watching birds, trying to, one, notice them, um, yeah, look at them and then try to identify them, learn, learn what, what species they were, what, you know, what sort of habitat they lived in, how they raised their chicks, all, all that sort of stuff. Um, that, was, that was probably the in for me. And that was, yeah, through having older people in my life who, who valued that and were willing to spend time and kind of aff affirm that, that um, interest that I had. Um, it's a really hard thing now with, with the amount of distractions we kind of have yeah. on tap in our, on our phone. Like there's a lifetime worth of, of numbing and distraction on that device, but it's certainly not making us happy. So I don't, I don't know how you'd, yeah. I mean, I, my advice to a young person would be like, what are you, what are you interested in? What, what sparks something in you? Mm. And how do you kind of go down the rabbit hole following that a bit? And, and you know, find other people who are interested in it and see where it, see where it leads. It's, a, it's such a tough question. Um, I mean, there's no like one answer, you no, know, it can no. be, you know, for some people time in nature, for others meditation or, or creative writing or, um, but all of those things, yeah, as Dave said, are getting increasingly hard to do. Yeah, I guess from my experience, you know, I um, decided to delete all the social media apps off my phone for a while just to have a break from them. Um, and then, you know, download them, downloaded them again, thinking that I was cured of my addiction. We've all been there. And like, I'm not a cured. These are multinational giant corporations, the richest corporations in the history of Earth who have heaps of people who are spending all their giant brain power on working out how to addict me. So like the problem's not with me, the problem's with them. Um, but I know for me, like I can only um, make time for reflection for attentiveness when I cut those things out of my life. And that's a really hard thing to do. And I think especially for young people who've grown up with that being a part of their life, forever you know it's not like I was of the generation where I only got a mobile phone when I was in year 12 um, and that might seem horrifying to some young people now but I'm so grateful for that because at least I've had a period of my life where I've had some distance from that kind of thing um, but you have to be really conscious of it to get a break from it um, and I think that that is really critical I think we live in a culture where we have very little time for reflection and it's, it, it does us all a disservice. Um, reflection is often used as a tool for punishment, especially for boys. Um, come and sit down and write out why you did what you did. <laughs> so often it's a dirty word. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But as I listen and read what you've written and watch you over your, your journey, the, the a, a, aliveness to what is around you in terms of place uh, and wild things and all the things that you've written about and photographed, uh, part of the clue as I see it is a willingness to be, allow yourself to be attentive. Quite simply, Mary Oliver style to the crack in the pavement and the, and the weed that's growing, let alone the, the jaw of the locust that's gyrating, so, you know, all those sorts of things. So, um, you model that well, I think, and your answer, Dave, is helpful in, if you like, where, what interests you. Mm. If it's not birds, what would it be? And, you know, we experience it in, in different ways. It, it's maybe sounding a little bit unrelatable to um, a bunch of young people the way I talked about it, but if you've ever played sport where you just kind of lose yourself mm -hmm. and you, you're just 
and all of a sudden, you know, the bell rings and you've been playing touch footy or football for half an hour. You're kind, you're kind of that's you're you're in you're sort of in that flow state. That's that's what you're doing, and I think that's a big part of being human is getting to the point where your senses are just so taken up by the thing that uh, you're doing um, that you forget about everything else. Um, and you know, I think a lot of young people have probably only really experienced that in sport, maybe in class sometimes when you're working on a problem that you're really interested in or you know, I don't, probably playing computer games. Yeah. Um, but I think that's available to us everywhere. You know, you can, you can go outside and, and experience that watching a dung beetle rolling a you know, dung ball or whatever it might be. Um, but it's about, yeah, as Mary Oliver talks about, actually cultivating it. Yeah, yeah n noticing, watching. Um, yeah, it's a real gift. Yeah, it is. Mm. And as you say, that any human being is naturally um, has accessible literally at your fingertips. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what, I we spent um, a few days uh, a few years ago with this guy in South Africa, Renius Mshlongo, who's he's arguably probably one of the best trackers in the world. He's kind of one of the last generation of South Africans who lived up, li that grew up kind of on the land and has been tracking his entire life. And we were following, uh, we were trying to catch up with this um, rhino that had kind of come through. And they said the spore was, was old, so we may not catch up with it. But just watching um, Renius and the way that he was just picking up on things and just so in tune um, with almost sort of, yeah, you could you just see like in his head it was kind of a movie of what actually happened. <laughs> and I remember thinking at one point like, this is probably how some of like my like most talented and like in tune rugby teammates actually feel on the field. Like you, you know, Kurt Lee Beal will do something and you'll think like, how on earth did he do that? Yeah. Like, well, what was he looking at? <laughs> yeah, how did he yeah, see yeah. that? Yeah. Um, but he's you know, just so in tune and noticing and then just backing his instinct. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely, a, I mean, it's part of being human. Yeah, yeah. And part of our nature and part of something that we have to cultivate, it seems, mm. in terms of home and fighting for something that we actually don't have a choice because we won't have one if we don't. Yeah. What questions have you been kicking around recently? What's been exercising your mind and heart? If that's not too personal a question. Um, I've been jumping back into reading about Martin Luther King lately. After, after school, I got pretty obsessed with Gandhi, <laughs> uh, which is slightly odd. Uh, and kind of read everything I could about him and that then kind of got onto Martin Luther King. Um, and yeah, recently just been going back and yeah, read, reading stuff that he, he wrote or his, his speeches and also stuff that's written about him. And I, I think there's so much we can learn um, from the civil rights movement when it comes to actually um, climate action because I think it's, it's something that there are clearly like deeply vested interests opposing action on climate change. Mm. But the reality is, is that we all win if there is meaningful action in the long term. Um, certainly some people are gonna lose um, financially, um, but it's a, it's a struggle that I think is gonna require a lot more um, people willing to sacrifice their civil liberties to actually, yeah, be willing to pay some sort of price to see, to see change. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not certain that it's something that's just gonna happen. Yes. So, yeah, that's something I've been um, in am amongst uni readings, been trying to, <laughs> been trying to look at. Yes. Hmm. 
Yeah, question for Emma. Um, so you're the CEO of a pretty exciting new project. Can you tell us a little bit about Frontrunners? Yeah, so I um, run an organisation called Frontrunners and our goal is to help athletes and sporting organisations uh, engage with climate and environment issues. Um, I guess it's born out of a decade of or more now almost of uh, working alongside Dave thinking through these kinds of issues and the barriers that athletes and sport face to engaging on things like this. Um, but increasingly, like over the summer, we saw the just here in Canberra, the Brumbies and the Raiders moved their pre-season training out of Canberra because you obviously couldn't train outside when the smoke mm -hmm. being as it was. Um, other sporting matches had to be cancelled, things postponed, times reshuffled. So that this stuff is coming to affect sport in a really um, practical way. Uh, so what we're hoping to do is help sport figure out how they're going to deal with those things, both in terms of the actual impact that it has on sport and then also the ways that sport can contribute to um, making change. Uh, I think they're in a great position to do that. The civil rights movement is a great example of where sport took a really active role. Um, well, some people involved in sport took a really active role in campaigning for something that ultimately was good for all of us. Um, yeah, it's exciting. We yeah, um, have only just started properly in the last few weeks, um, but we are hoping to do some really great work. Yeah, that's awesome to hear. Very conscious you guys have limited time. Um, so just wrapping it up with the most important question of all. Um, you're very, you might be aware our theme this year is tipping points. So I would like to know from you guys, um, in terms of climate change, do you think we've reached the tipping point or is it still yet to come? Yeah, uh, that's a huge, I'm not sure. I mean, I, th I think it's, it's probably no longer up for debate that we need drastic action. Um, I don't know, we've got a government that's kind of frustrated and sabotaged international talks to actually get like a meaningful international framework uh, agreement. And clearly, you know, are doing that on a, a national level here. Uh, and then we've got states and territories that are determined to actually take action and to become, you know, less reliant on coal and, and really invest in renewables and so I think we're in a yeah there's, it's certainly there's a struggle over at the moment. Yeah I mean I probably take a bit of a more positive view than Dave like I think that um, you know we've got so many businesses now coming out and talking about the need to change working out how they're going to map their own path to being powered by renewables being carbon neutral um, and that's why you know uh, I'm not interested in doing things that feel like a waste of time. That's why I'm doing front runners because I feel like we're really at that tipping point where um, there's so much momentum behind climate action. Um, and the big question I think is, what are we going to do? How are we going to address it? You know, I think that there's a real mass of people who want to do something about it, and it's not just the student climate strikers who I think have precipitated a lot of the businesses who are now coming on board and saying, yeah, actually, those kids are right. We do need to do something about this. Um, but the question now is, what are we going to do? And are we going to do it quickly enough? Um, so I feel really excited. I think um, we're in a position where we're seeing some really great leadership from people like the Energy and Environment Minister in New South Wales, Matt Keane, who's buying up land, setting up renewable energy zones, um, and we're able to see now what's possible. You know, you have Telstra committing to being fully powered by renewable energy and they're one of the 50 top energy users in the country. So there's lots of really exciting signs that things are happening. Um, and I just think we need to keep building that pressure and we'll get the right outcomes. Yeah, we might end it there on a positive note. Thank you so much guys for coming in and giving up your time today. You're amazing. You are. Amazing. It's so great to have it's you guys. Nice. It's yeah. good to have you guys. Yeah. It's good really. to chat. Yeah.